I'd like to thank very much the colleagues who organized this meeting, in particular Dr. Helen Haldicott, and uh, also the press for expressing their interest by being present. Uh, this presentation is a little bit out of the main type of presentations you have heard, uh, and it's a little bit technically complicated, so forgive me if I over or under aim my uh, explanations. For those who know the subject, it may be too simple, and for those who are not very much in the line of this kind of work, uh, it may not be clear, so please look me up. In any event, <clears throat> this is to stress that this is not a first observation. This is the third analysis and is the very first time after 10 years where we start letting some results out because the issue is credibility. It's not the data, but it's the credibility of the data. Um, uh, for a general, those who teach and have students or young researchers, I think the news releases by the WHO or the IAEA are masterpieces of language manipulation. So I would like to call your attention that IAEA now is basically behind WHO, so their declarations now are given to the young people in the name of the World Health Organization to which they should trust. Because if they don't trust the World Health Organization, then how can they trust much else? So the last one was in February 28th. And notice the similarities and the little nuances that are different. And one of those that I will show the 205 declaration is that now low-dose radiation appears as an if. And also the 100 millisieverts, the 100 gold standard, now appears to be lower. But all of that is sort of a nuanced thing. And if you read further, now reduction of exposure is important, while in 205, uh, in Kiev, they said the whole delegation told the Ukrainian government to cut off all the programs that minimized exposures to about 250,000 people. So I will start. Uh, this work required uh, cooperation of many people, many more than I can mention, and you can find out what is this OmniNet in the web. And uh, it involves international and Ukrainian colleagues. Now, here essentially is to point out that we have participants in the international group that are most of them focused on alcohol because alcohol is a teratogen, and a teratogen is any cause, environmental cause, that can create malformations or developmental problems. And in Ukraine, alcohol is a fairly common universal teratogen. So if you don't take that into account, you're going to get confused with another universal teratogen, which is ionizing radiation. Uh, among others, there are cultural anthropologists, mathematicians, people interested in statistics, nutrition, psychology, and so on. So we did what we could, and most of that uh, is done pro bono. And if not pro bono, none of it is done uh, connected with government or the nuclear power industry. I also want to tell you that data is data, and good data is good data, and the gold standard is this one. It's the Hiroshima Nagasaki studies by Dr. James Neal. And it's not only about cancer and cancer and cancer, it is also about congenital malformations. But I want to stress that these studies are not about teratogens. They are about gene mutations, 
which is completely different to what we are going to be talking about. I also want to point out that the radiation model, in our view, from Hiroshima and Nagasaki, is irrelevant to the Chernobyl situation because the ionizing radiation in Rivne is chronic, not acute. It's not a blast, but it's a continuous drip. It's not gamma or neutrons, but it's mainly beta type of radiation. It is not external, but it is inhaled or swallowed. And the people that were studied that then had children two years later in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, those parents were exposed to radiation, but their children that were conceived were conceived in a radiation-free environment. Nobody in his right mind went down to the hypocenter to conceive a child. All these people conceived children after Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So we referred to a release of IAEA in 2005, but actually the data was already done in 1995, and since then it has been pounding the same message. So one of our uh, collaborators, not collaborators, contributor, was Dr. Anspo, who very kindly explained to me, because I don't understand this process, of how this enormous committee came up with these things. And this is the release, more or less, in the shape of 10 years later. And notice a little bit of nuance difference. So it is sort of uh, presumptuous to say you're not going to find something. So presumptions are a little bit a derogatory term. But in any event, it freezes, or at least it makes it very chilled environment to say, well, I want to take a look. And so we convened a meeting exactly on the fifth anniversary of the Ukrainian independence. This is 90, uh, let's see, I forget. But anyhow, this is uh, 10 years, 1996, World Congress of Human Genetics, and we invite Dr. Anspo, we invite Dr. Neil, we talked to Dr. Joseph Warkany, who is the founder of Teratology. By the way, that's his etching. It's called Hiroshima Sh Shadows Without Men, and so on. And uh, we decided to explore the possibility. Dr. Lazuk from Belarus, Dr. Barry Lack represented the Academy of Sciences of Ukraine. We got together in Rio de Janeiro. We put in you know, a couple of sources of funding, and we decided to try. Well, as you know, there is a situation of power change. After Chernobyl, five years later, Ukraine decided to leave the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union collapses. There is a creation of a new government. There's a power struggle between points of view. And in that environment, we try to start an international program based on international standards to establish a population registry of every child born and every child examined. And that started in 2000. Now, the terms Chernobyl, you already know. Polisia is a region of Arivne. Polishchuks are the native people from Polisia. And Rivne is one of the 28 provinces of Ukraine. And we decided that we need to use international standards, so we said, okay, we're going to join the European Congenital Malformation Monitoring System, and we're going to make Ukraine a member of that system, and they are welcome to come and check the data. So we established teams across Ukraine, and slowly to quickly accumulate data, we were doing population monitoring, still do, in more than one province. And here is the cloud, and there is Rivne. And on, on the north, the northern half of the province is called Polisia. And further north is the river Pripyat, which you have heard before. And we quickly noticed that 
there is a departure of certain rates. And if you look at neural tube defects, Eurocat reports 10.2, we begin to see 18.5. And we notice anencephaly goes higher and microcephaly is higher and anophthalmia is higher. So it's a hypothesis. Let's then see what we can do. Let's put our very limited resources and crank it up. Then we realize that maybe we should concentrate on the dirtiest of the provinces. So we publish here and there, and we study Polish chooks, and we put something in human biology because the population isolate, and they may be inbred, and they look like Cajuns in Louisiana and so on. And here's the province. The northern half of the province geologically is different. It has no clay, virtually, no binders. So the radiation that fell, plus the index of transfer of that radiation to woods, to trees, to nutrients, to grass, is so much higher that in effect this is more contaminated than Jutomer, which is right next to Chernobyl. So this is the most contaminated area in Ukraine. And we also notice that the northern three counties are of particular interest. They are the most isolated, and I will come back to that. And they have seasonal flooding, just like in Louisiana. And that gives legs to a lot of radiation. It can move. So it's an ecologic isolate, it's a population isolate, as an isolate, they marry each other, and it has the highest index of transfer of cesium from soil to plant. And they have to eat or die from hunger because they can't go anywhere to buy food. They can't go anywhere to heat or else they freeze, so they burn radioactive wood. So to summarize, special population, special ecology, special radiation, well, we have a real niche ideal for multidisciplinary long-term studies of health impacts of anything. So we're not after selling that radiation is the only problem. We don't want children with congenital malformations, whatever the cause. So after confirmation, we are now starting this sort of presentations. And I'm going to only to talk about Policia and Rivne, and only to talk about two or three anomalies because, as you know, there are 500 of them. And we did, at the same time, surveys to try to narrow down what could be the cause. But this is description. This is descriptive epidemiology, which is not designed to prove cause-effect. It is only designed to prove what's going on. So, we know that the neural tube defects in policia are the highest in Europe. And that's up to Eurocat to say no. They are funded by the European Union to do exactly that. We also know that microcephaly is the highest in Europe. And so is microphthalmia. Three anomalies that are known to be associated with either alcohol or with either or both ionizing radiation, but there are little differences. So naturally, we were very lucky to have one of the longest NIH-funded projects to detect early, as early as possible, fetal alcohol syndromes before birth of these children. So we start with teratogenic risks Let's start with alcohol. That's where the money is, that's where the bank is, that's where the NIH pays for people to do, so we do. And we conclude that that cannot be an explanation of what we see in police. So we see a couple of thousand women, a considerable effort, we screen them, and we demonstrate that actually in Policia, these women that are pregnant drink much less, not much more than the other women that live in different cities. Secondly, we look at where do we find FASD, fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, and we find many more elsewhere. So the rates are higher away from policia than in policia. 
So we now look at radiation. Well, we don't have money, we don't have expertise, you are the experts, we are just plain pediatricians. We are pedestrian pediatricians. So, but we know that radiation has legs and they get mobilized regularly, the fires occur every summer. One kind of tree has 20 times as much radiation per kilogram than another kind of tree, so there's no point in generalizing. A burning pine is different from a burning willow, different organisms. And we know that this averaging out doesn't tell you a thing. It's a trick indeed, I agree. The averaging out tricks are not good enough for a mother of a child with a congenital malformation. And 76% of them heat and cook by burning wood and then take the ash and fertilize their little home garden. So they keep concentrating and concentrating. So actually the concentrations are higher now than they were 15 years ago because the bioconcentration takes time. And so the pregnant women do the easy task. They go and burn dried potato stems. The potato harvest is do or die. Potato is a central element of nutrition. And if you're old enough, sit home and burn radioactive wood and stay warm and cook potato pancakes. And you can go and get blintzes here in New York, in the Carnegie Deli, and they're terrible, so don't order them, just take a look at them. <laughs> so what do we do? We collect these plants and look at what's in them. So if a woman can incorporate radiation, can a potato? I presume it can incorporate. So we look, and to our surprise, we find strontium. We don't believe it, we run it again. And there it is, so we have a ratio of how much cesium to strontium, but all the measures and all the public health is based on cesium. We ignore strontium, and strontium for a fetus is much more important than we believe because potassium is everywhere, but strontium has to go to specialized enzymes and skeletons and teeth and dentin and all kinds of other things, and it's going to stay with that child and then it dies. So it's going to be radiating the potassium, they be urinating it out, the cesium. But the strontium, once you got you, it stays where it is. Now, I'm not going to repeat that, but anyhow, we take a couple of thousand people, 20,000 people, 20,000 measurements of whole body counts. It's a little bit a lot of work. And we find that 48% of women in those three counties are above what the Ministry of Health says is safe. So, here it is. Now, how sensitive is a fetus? Shall we compute a woman as an adult, although she is pregnant, or shall we focus on the sensitivity of the fetus? I don't know if a single citation, if you do, please give me, of what is the sensitivity of a fetus. We say a child has 3,800 becquerels upper limit and an adult 11,453 and three quarters. But how much does the fetus have? So anyhow, so here we are stuck. We did not expect to find things. We simply followed the lead. And now we have microcephaly, not alcohol. It can be due to all kinds of things, from abracadabra to the moon to whatever have you. This is descriptive epidemiology. But also has to be logical. So let's check. Maybe we miss minor effects, minor reductions of the head size. Because we did a very strict definition of microcephaly of three standard deviations or less. Otherwise, you are not microcephalic. You can be very, very retarded and have epilepsy and have a very small head. But if it's not three standard deviations, you, you, we don't count you. But now let's do the other way. Let's measure all the heads. So this is a comparison of about 15,000 measurements at birth. And to our surprise, no difference in birth weights. but a statistically significant reduction of head size in those three counties. Uh, what are you going to do with that? This is subclinical probably, I don't know. 
probably these children, you won't distinguish them from anyone else. But it's known radiation effect in the nervous system. So let's look beyond Ukraine. Well, there are studies by very reputable epidemiologists. They were then working at the CDC and they go to Hanford and they do a first study and they find neural tube defect elevations and they dismiss it because of whatever reason. Good reasons, but nonetheless, they are good scientists, so they repeat the study. And they confirm the study. Different approach. And they dismiss it again fundamentally because it contradicts the Hiroshima-Nagasaki observations. Not because of the inherent flaw of the study, but it doesn't make sense in the context of the golden standard. But the golden standard had nothing to do with teratology. It had to do with hereditable, heritable forms of microcephaly. These are environmentally induced microcephalies. It's not that the gene came in and said, don't make the brain. No, the genes were fine, but the radiation said, die and reduce your size. So it's comparing apples and pears. And then there is a study in Sellafield. An editor from a reputable journal one time said, I misquoted it, and I said, you better read it again because these are very subtle paragraphs here and there, but nonetheless, the most common anomaly among the most commons are neural tube defects, and there it is. But, you know, there were a lawsuit about leukemia clusters near Sellafield and so on. The atmosphere was very charged. This study was not repeated. Then Eurocat does two studies, but doesn't study anybody near Chernobyl. Okay, only Western Europe, way out there. And good, bad, or indifferent, they say that we don't see anything. This is the path of the radiation and circling around England. And when we compare the actual rates that Eurocat reports, to our surprise, yes, Policia region is the highest, but so is Northern England, Wales, and we can see the highest rate, the second highest rate, the third highest rate, and we keep finding these regions in Wales and Northern England. I don't report those data. Those regions report the data. They don't report to me, they report to Eurocat, and we report to Eurocat, and supposedly we are trying to use the same methods, but it is imprudent to statistically compare these things because still there are a lot of confounding factors that one didn't explore, but simply it's an informational piece. And Dr. Yablokov and many others have pointed out that mental health is a big problem, is part of the radiation syndrome. So in Sweden there are studies, and in Norway there are studies that show that those who were in utero at the time in the center of those two countries independently, they find cognitive deficiencies. So that is consistent with that subclinical reduction of the head that I was showing you before. So we have arrived basically at the end of the trip. So what do we do? We cannot say that this study is cause and effect. This study is a descriptive study, but we do provide a foundation for cause and effect. We have a specific population, we have a specific pattern of malformations, and we have a specific geographic area. Rather than running around and reassembling the liquidators and getting at random a bunch of mix-up ethnologies and different varieties of people and then extrapolating results. We have a population registry of every baby born in the last 10 years with name of the mother and everything else. So what do we conclude? Either we are not talking about reality and I wouldn't be here. We waited for three analyses and I think that from our side, that's not so. Now, 
Those who think that this is unreal, whether they are IAEA or whoever, they are welcome to come and check the data. Or these malformations are there, but they are not due to radiation. So that those whole body counts of pregnant women and potatoes and all that, that's totally irrelevant. Prove it. Let's prove it. I think that's important enough to dismiss it with some prospective case control or whatever other epidemiologic studies you wish. Not this one. This one opens the key and the door to facilitate and expedite such an investigation. Or maybe the fetus is far more sensitive than the standards we apply to it. And finally, maybe actually the doses are not what they said to be. And probably all of these factors, plus alcohol, plus malnutrition, plus lack of folate acid, and plus of so many birth defects, congenital malformations, require the convergence of two things. Multiple things that disrupt the development and multiple things that disrupt the repair of the damage because we have regenerative capabilities. So you have this balance, and if it is unbalanced, then the morphogenesis of the embryo becomes altered. So I did not talk about conjoined twins, but that's what we see. I did not talk about teratomas, that is what we see. I did talk a little bit about neural tube defects, but there are many subcategories and associations. I did talk with microcephaly, and I did not touch much about microphthalmia, but there are all kinds of things that the world needs to know because these birth defects occur in China and in Indonesia, India, and anywhere else, and the more we know, the better we're going to prevent them. So what I want to tell you is that as a physician, prevention is first, not epidemiology. And we know how to prevent. We know that in China, this is J.R. Perry, a good friend who spent part of his life, his children went to school in China in order to do this. That he proved conclusively that you can reduce 50% or more neural tube defects by one pill that costs, you can get about 60 pills for 60 days for the price of one pack of cigarettes. And we can't find the pills. So it is an immediate need to act. And we have been working with the government on yes, tomorrow, yes, tomorrow, yes, tomorrow. It needs to be done. I agree. But secondly, these people don't need to be exposed to radiation because they don't need to swallow it. Give them milk, give them potatoes, give them flour. But bring it from somewhere else. Then we know about alcohol and campaigns about alcohol. And the authorities have enough resources and know-how to do it today. But if international partnerships step in, that's more likely. And it's more likely to be done better. And the existing monitoring can show, not just to Ukraine, but the world, all the nuances of prevention. For instance, is folic acid going to prevent neurotube defects when you have a bunch of people exposed to radiation, or is it going to be totally ineffective? And if it is effective, would it be effective in Fukushima, regardless if they have spina bifida or not? Should Fukushima exposed people get folic acid? Those are questions that transcend Ukraine and call for solidarity. And Western Europe needs to learn a little bit more because we are the only program unfunded by the European Union. There are 39 programs. We are the only ones who don't get a penny to monitor congenital malformations that they publish. And if Chernobyl is not relevant to Europe and congenital malformation threat, I'm sorry, but I, I'm confused. 
So here is the Kanto principle that some people alluded to, and I want to dedicate this. We detected her before she was born. I found her abandoned in a hospital because the mother wasn't even told that she had a living child. The mother was told, you delivered a monster that was dead, and get, go home, forget it, try again. The mother got so depressed, she left the country. And here we have this little orphan that has no hip, no sex, no ovaries, no uterus, and full of joy of life. She ends up in an orphanage, and we find the grandma, who eventually comes and picks her up. The grandmother brings the mother. This child now is a high school graduate, somewhere in Western Europe. It proves two points we can do, but also their brain is spared because these anomalies are very early ones, and if you don't die, you're going to develop everything else like everybody else. If the damage is late, regeneration is diminished, and you cannot restitute what you lose as much as if you start very early. Think of congenital twins. Every monozygotic twin is a congenital malformation that is perfect otherwise, but it's a malformation nonetheless. And that's a typical, from one I get exactly a copy of another. I regenerate me. So thank you for your attention, and I hope you join us. Oh yeah, go on, click the subscribe button. We need to get subscribe and get this unity stronger and beat YouTube at their own game. Okay, that's what this is about. Like I say, go to the remix button, hit the remix button. That way you'll have this video and, and keep up with this. Otherwise, you know, YouTube's just going to control us guys and it's, it's really bad.